How does urine form? Urine formation consists of three steps, pressure filtration, selective reabsorption, and tubular excretion. The first step, pressure filtration, occurs at the glomerulus. The glomerulus is a network of capillaries. As blood enters through the afferent arteriole, blood pressure forces fluid and small molecules out of the capillaries. Many of these will eventually be reabsorbed into the blood by active transport and water will return by osmosis. The filtrate consists of one-fifth plasma, which is mostly water, ions, nutrients, and nitrogenous wastes. What remains in the blood is blood cells and plasma proteins and you can see that as the fluid is pressure filtered and a lot of water leaves the blood, the blood that's leaving the glomerulus via the efferent arteriole is actually a lot more concentrated and has much higher osmotic pressure. Many of the materials forced out of the blood vessels are materials that the body needs to retain so much of the rest of what happens in the nephron is involved in returning these materials back to the blood. A lot of energy is spent in returning these materials to the blood. What needs to remain in the tubules is the waste, the urea, the uric acid and the ammonia. And we'll see that as the fluid moves through the tubules and materials that the body needs to keep are returned to the blood, the wastes become very, very concentrated. So the rest of the nephron is for selective reabsorption. If the process of blood filtration by the nephrons is analogous to cleaning out a drawer, pressure filtration is like dumping out the contents of the drawer. After that, you gradually return to the drawer what you'd like to keep. This is analogous to selective reabsorption. In selective reabsorption, the objective is to reabsorb back into the blood materials needed by the body. This means removing these materials from the tubules and putting it back into the blood. These materials are removed from the rest of the nephron. Of the filtrate that's forced out of the glomerulus, 97% of that filtrate is reabsorbed. This means that 178 liters of the 180 liters of fluid produced per day is actually returned back into the blood. At the proximal tubule, materials are returned to the blood by both active and passive transport. Passive reabsorption requires no energy, that is no ATP, for the materials to return back to the blood. Water is reabsorbed passively by osmosis. The reason for this is that the blood in the capillaries surrounding the proximal tubules is very viscous. Solutes are in very high concentration. This is true because the blood leaving the glomerulus has had most of the fluid forced out of it and what remains is large quantities of proteins and blood, vet, blood cells but very little fluid. As a result, water is drawn back into the blood by osmosis. Active reabsorption also takes place and for this energy in the form of ATP is required. Active reabsorption is selective. Only molecules required by the body are reabsorbed. Glucose, amino acids, vitamins and hormones. Sodium is reabsorbed by active transport as well. Chloride ions follow the sodium passively. 65% of water in filtrate gets reabsorbed from the proximal tubule back into the paratubular capillaries. The rest gets reabsorbed in subsequent sections of the tubule. Let's take a look next at what happens in the loop of Henle, which has a descending limb and an ascending limb. The primary role of the loop of Henle is water reabsorption back into the blood. This occurs because a concentration gradient causes osmosis. Water leaves the tubules and moves into the blood. Since water is absorbed into the blood by osmosis, the osmotic pressure of the tissue surrounding the loop is raised. The construction of the loop of Henle facilitates this. The ascending limb is impermeable to water. Sodium, however, is actively pumped out to the tissues surrounding the tubules. Water remains in the tubule. 
As a result, the filtrate in the tubule becomes more dilute as it moves up the loop of Henle. There's less sodium per milliliter of fluid. The descending limb is permeable to water. Since the sodium accumulates outside the loop of Henle in the medulla region, water is drawn out of the descending limb into the surrounding tissue and ultimately back into the blood. Filtrate moving down the tubule becomes more concentrated. Therefore, an osmotic gradient is created by sodium pumped out of the ascending limb. This causes water to move out of the descending limb. The net effect is that we have a concentration of nitrogenous wastes. We're moving water from the descending limb, removing sodium from the ascending limb, and what comes out at C is very different that what went, than what went into A. At A there was a lot of water, sodium, and wastes. It was a dilute solution. At C much of the water has been returned to the blood and what's left is a concentration of nitrogenous wastes. In the loop of Henle, where is the filtrate most concentrated? Well let's just follow the solutes. Entering the loop of Henle we have a solution which includes water as the solvent, quite a bit of water, and sodium and nitrogenous wastes. As the fluid moves down the loop of Henle, water is being removed and returned to the medulla region and into the blood vessels. And so the further the solution travels down the descending limb, the more concentrated it becomes. As the fluid moves back up, sodium is removed and so it becomes less and less concentrated. However, water has been removed over here and what we're concentrating is the nitrogenous waste because sodium is also being removed. So that what we have at C is a concentration of urea, uric acid, and ammonia. What we had going in had a lot of water, urea, uric acid, ammonia. Here we have far less water. So if you were to actually take a look at the color of the solution here, you would notice that it was very pale, maybe colorless. If you looked at the solution here, it would look yellowish, very yellow if you were very dehydrated. And that yellow tinge comes from the concentration of those nitrogenous wastes. So as you move from the cortex to the medulla, you would have an increasing concentration of filtrate that corresponds to an increasing concentration of sodium in the interstitial fluid surrounding the tubules. So our concentrated fluid moves on to the distal tubule. And at the distal tubule, active transport, which requires energy, of other non-filterable materials occurs. These are added to the tubular fluid for excretion and include such materials as the antibiotic penicillin, which our body recognizes as foreign and very efficiently removes at the distal tubule, histamines formed in allergic reactions, excess hydrogen ions to regulate blood pH, and excess ammonia that was not already pressure filtered. In other words, it went through the glomerulus, but some of it remained in the efferent arterial as it left uh, the glomerulus. So that ammonia is then deposited directly into the distal tubule. As we'll see in a moment, adding hydrogen and ammonia in this way to the distal tubule can help regulate and maintain normal blood pH of 7.4. Here's how it works. If blood is slightly too acidic, more hydrogen ions and ammonia are secreted into the distal tubules directly from the blood. This is shown with very, very thick arrows to show that a lot of hydrogen ions, a lot of ammonia ions can be secreted in this way if the blood is too acidic. Excess hydrogen ions are combined with ammonia to form ammonium, NH4, and transported to the cells of the collecting ducts. The NH4 then dissociates back into ammonia and hydrogen ions. Both are secreted into the fluid within the distal tubule. When the blood is too acidic, more bicarbonate ions are also reabsorbed back into the blood because the bicarbonate ions will act as a buffer for excess hydrogen ions and along with that more sodium is also reabsorbed back into the blood. If the problem is that the blood is too basic, fewer hydrogen ions and fewer ammonia ions are secreted into the distal tubules directly from the blood and this is shown with thinner arrows fewer sodium ions and fewer bicarbonate ions are reabsorbed back into the blood 
because the blood is already alkaline and we don't need the buffer bicarbonate to counter any low pH. The pH is not low. As a result of tubular secretion, blood pH is regulated and maintained within normal limits of 7.3 to 7.4. Consequently, urine pH can fluctuate between 4.5 and 8.5. And excess potassium ions are also disposed of by tubular secretion. What sorts of things might cause our blood pH to move to be slightly more acidic or slightly more basic? Think about it and we can discuss this in class. We'll talk about the collecting ducts next. As we've already seen in our discussion with the loop of Henle, we know that the cortex region has fluid that is isotonic to the fluid in the tubules. However, we know that the solution outside of the loop of Henle and in the medulla is hypertonic to the solution inside the tubules. This is in order to produce a lot of water reabsorption back into the blood through osmosis. The collecting duct is variably permeable to water, meaning that it can allow more or less water to return back into the blood, that is, leave the tubule. If the body is poorly hydrated, the duct is more permeable to water and more water will be reabsorbed back into the blood. If the body is overhydrated, we've had a lot to drink, haven't been perspiring a lot, the collecting duct is less permeable to water and more water remains in the tubules and eventually makes its way to the bladder and the outside world. In the next video we'll take a look at the homeostatic mechanisms involving the collecting duct.